Hey guys, uh, it's Tim from uh, Second in Command. Hey Second in Commanders, uh, it's Matt Walsh. Uh, I have good news and bad news. Um, the bad news is that I know you're expecting the Julio Dreyfus episode to be coming out this week. Uh, it's not. That's the bad news. It's coming out next week, but that's not the good news. The good news is, is that we've got so many fan questions that we're actually putting together an entire episode just of fan questions. I know that like the, the good news there doesn't really equal the bad news, but just maybe there's slightly good news and that eventually it's coming. We hope you're safe. Keep rating, reviewing, and liking the, uh, the show. I hope you had a good uh, holiday with your loved ones. I hope those rapid tests work, and uh, I'll see you soon. Peace. It's time for... Sue, did the president call? No, but these fans did. Hi, my name's Nadia, and I'm from San Diego, and I have a two-part question for you guys. First, I was wondering, what's your creative process when you're developing your characters? Like, developing the mannerisms and your guys' like instant clapbacks with your insults. Was that something that you guys developed it, developed like immediately, or was that something that took time and it was gradual? I was also wondering, Julia Louis Dreyfus is a producer as well as the lead actress on the show. And I was wondering, was that difficult having someone like having to watch as well as act, or was that something that you guys were all just okay with or that you guys did together? Anyways, thank you. Love the show. Uh, thanks, Nadia. That's yeah, a, thank those you, are Nadia. Really good questions. Really I'm good a questions. big fan of a two-part question, by the way. Love that. I love it. I, I love a two-part question yeah. as well. Yeah. Arvin, who sounded more authentic in their love of two-part questions? I just like anything that tees it up. I've, this is a two-part question. Yeah. Just, I just, I enjoy that. <laughs> I'll go first if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah, go ahead. So the mannerisms and character development, for example, I've noticed in the first season of Veep, Mike seems to be eating more and more. Now, that was something <laughs> that was encouraged by Armando and the writers, Armando and the writers, because they found it funny. But it was a tiny thing in the beginning, and I embraced it and just went hog wild with it. And they laughed at it. So that became something that basically, in theory, made the room laugh. And that's sort of how we operated in this show. As far as characteristics and research, I think we've covered that, but I based my character on a Chicago guy who had connections, but he's sort of outdated by the the media of it all. And then, uh, do you want the first part of the two part? And then I'll go to the second part of the yeah, two part. Yeah, I'll do the first go part ahead. of the two part. So I would say that like a, a big thing that I, this is just like one of those things I learned in school was to look at what the character says about themselves and look at what all the other characters say about them when mm. that character isn't around. Mm. Uh, and all, well, anyway, what, like what, what does the character say about themselves and uh, themselves and what does everyone else say about that character? And so I remember that being a big thing, a especially with all the insults in our show, like that did sort of did help color that. But like, then again, like that was something that, um, that was something that I was, you deal with, uh, or I was taught using plays an exa as an example and plays rarely change or they just don't like the, the, in theater, like the powers with the writer and in television and film, like the writer doesn't really have a lot of power or they will just intentionally change it all the time. Like it's much more malleable. So like that isn't necessarily as important in the film and television part, uh, cause it all changes so much, but that's just like one example of something that I would do to sort of inf to inform the character stuff. That's good. That's good insight. I also would say that the chasm between Jonah's perception of himself and how people perceived him was very large. Whereas Mike felt like, ah, I'm doing fine. And people were like, you're not doing fine. It was a smaller chasm in a yeah, way. No, <laughs> but Jonah's like, I'm crushing it. And everyone's like, get the fuck out of here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's so, an interesting gap. And how do you, and I think what I was trying to do is like, okay, well, what, what is it about him that allows him to like to fill out that chasm? Like if it's that wide, yeah. how does he bridge that? Yeah. Between what is clearly coming in and what he thinks is like, how does he? Well, he colors it as envy or jealousy, doesn't he? Yes. Certainly. Yeah. yeah. And then the second part of the two part, Nadia, is Julia's producer. To me, one of the great things about Julia is when we would do these table reads, as producer, she got to go in as uh, a writer on those rewrites. Like, I feel like for me, I don't know. I just liked it because I always feel like she was one of us in a way, like she was an actor. Not that there was ever any kind of divide between us and the writers, but in a good way, we would do these script reads 
and we would hang out all day and we would share thoughts about our characters. And we would, we would always be like, we got to protect our character and fight for our character in a good way, like very supportive environment, which is what you want with fellow actors. And uh, I liked that another actor was in the room. So in a way, in the writer's room on those rewrites. So in a way, her being a producer, I don't know what her burden was because she, I'm sure, was stressed out by a lot of stuff that she kept secret from us because she had a direct line to all the HBO communication and all the, you know, Eng- you know, all the English writers communication. And we were sheltered from some of that, some of the drama. So I'm sure it was stressful for her as well. But I did as a fellow actor, liked having another actor in the writer's room, especially after those uh, table reads. I agree with everything that Matt said. The one thing that I will, uh, the one thing that I would add is that I, I think having Julia specifically in there was good. I think that there are probably situations in the past in which this hasn't gone well because you might have been dealing with somebody like you might have been dealing with somebody that didn't have the other actors in the show uh, in their in mind in mind as much, yeah. or maybe that person would be like sort of directly uh, uh, confrontational or like. The bet that, that wouldn't have the best interests of the of the other actors in mind, and you just had somebody that was sort of like out for themselves, and that's just not what Julia was there doing. Like she, no, was somebody I think that, she realized that we all rise, to, you know, in a good yes. way. Like, of course, we all have egos, but she definitely was a team player. Yeah. So yeah. that is sort of like you know, that is one thing that I would say is like that power is probably misused in some circumstances, but with Julia, she was always somebody who. Uh, who wanted the show to succeed across the entire across the entire board? Mm-hmm. Just wanted the show to succeed, and so worked with everybody's best interests at heart. Yeah. Hi, Matt and Tim. My number one question for you is probably: How many times did you have to break per episode because you were laughing so hard? I have joked a lot about uh, uh, like a sort of lack of professionalism when I would break, um, and it happened a lot with me and I there are I think there are times that I see it I think I even see it in this episode like in baseball there's a time that I break and I always don't like seeing it happen on camera because it kills the bit it kills the joke it's not right you're not the you're not the character responding to the situation you're the actor laughing at the joke and I never like it when I do it but it is fun sometimes shit is just really funny on set and it happens it happened a lot especially when you were caught off guard by stuff I just mm-hmm. never like not being able to get it back together to get the moment on camera yeah um I think the new stuff did make us take make me laugh or certainly physically once you get in the set and if you're on top of each other or somebody's discovered something brand new so the new stuff would make me would catch me off guard and would make me laugh. But generally, we were table reading this stuff. We were rehearsing this stuff. We were working it in rehearsal on its feet, on location before we filmed it. So we were sort of used to the material and gotten our most of our giggles out. So that yeah. was that was the good news. But yeah, I, I think so, the new stuff would make me laugh occasionally. And I don't like when I see cracks of it. In fact, in this episode, when I'm whispering... Or the next episode, never mind. There is one episode where I see something and I'm whispering in Dan's ear about that I know information. And I feel like it's a little giggly and I don't like it too because I think the giggles is, let energy escape in a way that you're not as focused. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And weirdly, I would also say just on that, that like it's almost, it's always the quiet moments. It's always the quieter moments where you really have to like, the, the, the quieter moments where you have to keep stuff in is where I would break more. Yeah. Because then I maybe it is maybe it's just the gap between how funny you think it is and where it's supposed to be played. When that gets wider, it becomes harder to bridge. But that's that's me. Yeah. Good question. Hi, Matt and Tim. It is Lucy here from New Zealand. Um, I was just wondering if you could see Veep recreated in another country's government. What country would you like that to be in? I'm going to go ahead and say that I don't know that I know enough about other countries' governments mm-hmm. to say that because they've already done this in the UK and that the thick of it kind of, you know, Venn diagram overlapped with our show a lot. So we couldn't do it in the UK. Well, 
I would like to see, I agree with that. I know nothing about any, I barely know enough about our country's politics yes. and I know nothing about other countries because I'm American and we just see our country on a map and we're like, what's all this other stuff? It but, would, <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead. But I would say like if I had a perfect world and way to go New Zealand. I just like that we have fans in New Zealand, which I've never been to, but if we get there, Lucy, we're going to look you up and look for some, uh, I'll sleep on a sun porch, quite honestly. I don't need fancy Yeah, no, dates. absolutely. If you have like a cot, I'll sleep on a yeah, cot. we're coming down. Lucy. I don't eat like a lot of bread. So like don't, maybe if you're like making lunch, like don't plan on sandwiches. I like the bread specifics. Very interesting. But I would love to see it happen if they could create the show in a, in a country like China, because I do believe in the power of humor. And I do believe really strict countries like a China, for example, would benefit from deflating the facade and sort of, I don't know, meanness of a government. I, I would love to see it in a country like China, if that makes I, sense. I was going to go the same direction in that, like, I do think it would be kind of funny to place our show in North Korea. Yeah. In that, in that it would kind of be funny if the stakes for fucking up, if the stakes for fucking up <laughs> were basically like, you're now going to get eaten by dogs mm -hmm. or like there are like those rumors of like uh, like there was one time i heard that there was a rumor that kim jong-un there was like somebody like an official that he was unhappy with sent him out into a field and fired an anti-aircraft gun at him <laughs> and like that's how he was i mean who knows if that's actually true but like it would be funny to play these scenes with those stakes well you should see armando inucci stalin movie because oh, they, yes, they do exactly absolutely. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of this, two different points, but the same idea. I'd like to see it because I think those societies would most benefit yes. from like undermining the politic. And you're saying it because the stakes are insanely high in insanely those nations. Insanely high in a yeah. place like that. Good question. Did you know everyday delicious groceries fall through the cracks of our food system because of how they look? I got to say, like, I don't want a giant orange or a perfect looking freaking apple because they never taste as good as the real ones. Imperfect Foods is turning this around by sourcing quirky but delicious foods and delivering them to you in a way proven to reduce emissions. Imperfect Foods is a grocery delivery service offering an entire line of sustainable groceries that taste delicious and reduce waste. So make a difference in our food system by embracing some natural imperfections and get your groceries delivered weekly from, with Imperfect Foods. Yeah, and on average, Imperfect Food customers save six to eight pounds of food from lesser outcomes with every order. And unlike on-demand delivery companies, Imperfect delivers weekly by neighborhood, a unique model that produces 25 to 75% fewer emissions than individual trips to the grocery store. Uh, I've used Imperfect Foods before. I just put in a bunch of things that I liked and they all showed up at my door and they were great and it saved me a trip to the store and uh, it was seamless. Yeah. In fact, it, you really, um, it was it was too easy. So right now, Imperfect Foods is offering our listeners 20% off your first four orders when you go to imperfectfoods.com and use promo code BEEP. Again, that's 20% off your first four orders. That's up to an $80 value at imperfectfoods.com. Offer code when you use the promo code VEEP. Imperfectfoods.com and use VEEP. Again, 20% off your first four orders. That's up to an $80 value. It's at imperfectfoods.com and use the promo code VEEP. When I was a kid and an adult and all the ages in between, I would eat cereal just about every single day of my life. Um, I used to fill up salad bowls with cereal and uh, use a half a gallon of milk and sit down and eat the entire thing. And it turns out that's massively unhealthy if it's like a carb-filled, sugar-filled cereal. And at this age, and our adult age, Tim, you got to cut down on carbs and sugar and unhealthy food. And you're thinking like, oh, I can't eat cereal anymore. Well, nope, not true. Tell me. Magic because spoon. Ma magic spoon. There's zero grams of sugar, 13 or 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. That's about, that's only 140 calories a serving, Tim. So it's keto friendly. It's gluten free. It's grain free. It's soy free. And it's low carb. And you got to get the variety pack. I got the variety pack. It was delicious. Four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. And you could even like mix and match some of the flavors. You could put cocoa together with peanut butter. That tastes like a peanut butter cup. So go to magicspoon.com slash veep and grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code veep 
at checkout and you'll save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash veep and use the code veep to save $5. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. Hi, Tim. This is Beth. I'm curious if it was hard for you to be insulted all the time. The the jabs that everyone takes at Jonah are such a highlight of the show. Was there one that landed too closely uh, to a sensitive spot? And is there one that people like shout at you on the street when you're taking a walk? Hi, Beth. Is the, the, she said that in such a way, well, she backed me up on this. She said that in such a way that makes me think that I know her. Is that a Beth that I know? But she didn't say her last name. She did sound familiar, it, but you it have was that. very familiar. It's so, kind of like what um, Will Smith has, Tim. You have that quality. Like people feel like they see you in a movie and they know you. You have that it factor. So, okay. So either, either Beth and I have a real relationship or we have a parasocial one. And either way, that's totally fine. Hi, Beth. How's it going? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, the, the one, this is a, there's actually a very easy answer for this and that is, they really did not bother me most of the time, but there was one time that there was like a mention about my hips. And when at one point, I think when I was in like middle school, my mom bought these pants that I think might've been like women's jeans and they were like kind of cut to exaggerate my hips which I, which I've always been, it's like a sensitive, sensitive thing. Um, and I was, I think I was teased a lot, but because, you know, I was like raised by frugal Mainers, she bought like, and I think I grew out of every piece of clothing that I wore within a matter of months. So she knew they weren't going to be sticking around. She just, they were on sale. She probably bought like four pairs of them. It was just like, here, wear these out. And they were pretty bad. And I got teased a lot. And, uh, so the, there was one that had a mention of my hips that really brought up some, uh, some seventh grade stuff. Um, the one that gets brought up the most often, and I think it's because it's a quick in and out is Jonah. That's the one that I hear the most because it's like the one that people can just like get right out. It's just, it's there. You don't have to build it up. You don't have to set it up. It's just right there. It's like calling out somebody's name. That was Thank good you for the that question. Was, that was a good response too, because you were very vulnerable and honest, which this just show has been like therapy for you today. I feel like you've been really forthcoming with. Yeah. really been working through a lot of stuff. I love it. I, love I know the question wasn't directed to you, Matt, but do you have an insult that really stuck to you? Um, I don't think so. You know, sad egg was the only one that like, I don't know. I think of, <laughs> I don't really like being called a sad egg. I feel like that's pretty, that's cute though. It's yeah. Very- but it's like, uh, implying your demeanor is always sad. It's like, well, I hope I don't always come into the room with that. But, uh, no, not in the same way, but I, I will say like, whenever those moments are coming, I do cringe at like, oh God, please let's get through this. Do people think that about me? You know what I mean? It's hard to separate your, yourself from that. Hi there, Vanita from Australia here. Just wondering what your thoughts are on how several characters have the same names. So Andrew Doyle and Andrew Meyer. Uh, Teddy Sykes and Selena's boyfriend, Ted, Dan Egan and Danny Chung. Just wondering if you think that was deliberate or if it just happened. Thanks so much. Weirdly, I actually had not, I had thought what, what I usually think about when it comes to similar names is that there's a Gary, uh, there's a character Gary and there's a, uh, an actor Gary. There's a, Walsh in the show. There's and a there's Walsh, a Walsh there's a, Gary Walsh. There's a yeah, there's a Gary Walsh. There is also a Walsh actor. So that's usually where all my confusion comes up or, or comes up. I actually had not ever put it together that there were that many similar names. Cause I feel like it's not one of the things that they tell you. It's like one of those stupid things about screenwriting where they're like, you, you don't even have a character that has the same letter as the first name. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like that is, I, that must have just been like a, you know, we're behind. And all of a sudden they were like, I just, whatever, a name. They're like, Andrew, Dan, you know what I mean? I think that is like sometimes not getting hung up on it. I also think like being British and looking at America, 
it's almost like if Tim and I were conjuring up a British name and someone said Nigel, we'd say great. Or someone said, you know, Rutherford, we'd say great. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't think they're going to fight for a name that's like super American or super authentic. I think like they probably enjoyed the simplicity of names. And there's and always sometimes too, like you pointed out in the Julia scene, like simple or quicker is funnier. Like, don't try to be funny with it. Like in the way that like being a Karen is a thing, like it's just like, it's a simple name before it was attached to a certain awfulness. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. For a while, Karen was a name for comedy. When I was writing sketches in the 90s for our sketch show UCB, I would always write a woman's name as Karen because I just found that name funny and simple for whatever reason. And it was common. Yeah, and now it's, and yeah. now it's a whole different thing. Yes, yes. But at the time, it was just common. And so in a way, like using Teddy or Gary or Walsh or what were the other examples? There is overlap. Andrew. Yeah, Andrew, um, Amy, Bruckheimer's, Anna Klumsky. Originally, the character was called Anna. I think mm-hmm. simplicity's sake is is kind of saying like, these are the elements that we don't have to worry about, so let's just keep it simple. And then the really dialed in sort of complicated things can be plot and, and perhaps joke worthy. There's an authenticity to it. If you're borrowing from someone in the room who's named Walsh or Gary, then you have proof that it's a common thing in America. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that would be uh, my answer. Hi, my name is Ria. I'm from India. My question for you is, do y'all miss seeing more gray characters in today's TV? As the gray characters which do exist, or rather the villains, forget the gray characters, which do exist in today's TV are along the lines of, oh, I borrowed a pencil and I forgot to return it. And that's the whole plot of the show. Whereas in Veep, it's like Dan hooks up with a girl, next day doesn't show up. Selena constantly changing her morals and ethics as per what gives her more votes. And even in today's episode, she says something like, um, fat people make her uncomfortable which if it was released today a lot of people will take offense to that and i feel like there should be inclusivity of those kind of characters because they do exist they're based on real people so yeah i wondered if y'all missing more gray characters thank you for your question that's a really good question yeah we love hearing from you india I would say that I um, I love both playing and watching anything with very morally complex uh, uh, characters, and I'm willing to go with a lot in in movies and TV shows that I watch. I I think it's rare that you get on that you get to work for people who are willing to let co- characters go that far, because I think the worry would be that the audience isn't going to connect with them or that they're not going to be likable. And so I think that's why you don't see it because there are P- there are executives or whoever that are like, you know, well, you just can't do that because they're going to be unlikable. Um, so I think that's why you don't see more of it. Um, but at the same time, like our show wasn't like, we didn't set the world on fire ratings wise. And so maybe there's a reason that they say that. Yeah, I think... You're right. I feel like there is a plethora of like, certainly in drama Mm -hmm. of like really fascinating characters inside many, many shows. Uh, And I too tend to like, when I do watch TV, I tend to watch movies more for some reason, but when I get pulled into a TV series, it is like these characters that have like this great latitude to be like awful, but also, well, that's actually good. And and like, you're kind of... The, the width or the wavelength of behavior that that is afforded to a very complex character is wonderful to be drawn into so like a very yeah. wide wavelength um and then recently i, I want to say i want to say i've recently been pulled back into curb your enthusiasm which this latest season which i feel like i'm plugging an hbo show but it's true like i i didn't watch it for the longest time because i didn't like Larry David's acting, I always felt like he was laughing and it was like two-dimensional. I mean, I'm being judgmental. Uh (laughs) He's obviously a comic genius and the storylines are great, but the acting, I was just like, I can't. But I feel like he's gotten better at acting and I also think the show's gotten more complex with like whatever, for my taste, like who the fuck am I? But I'm one viewer saying this, but always, for whatever reason, through the seasons I didn't watch, I feel like he's a very complicated 
comedic character. And I think perhaps maybe that's what your point is. Like oftentimes in comedies, characters don't get to be complicated. Certainly inside like a network system that has to have a broad appeal, yeah. you have to win them over or make them likable or teach a lesson or the notes that you would get from supervisors or uh, executives around those shows can't be like too nuanced or too like uh, gray. You're speaking to gray characters, but like a character like Larry David is a great example of a comedic character who has a great bandwidth of different behaviors uh, that's afforded to him because he's like very complex. There's something, I do think it's rare that, well, I think we were allowed to ultimately on our show, we were allowed to ultimately be somewhat irredeemable. And I like that the show never really tried to redeem them. We never tried to like, oh, they did a bunch of bad stuff, but at the end of the day, they love each other. Like at the end of the day, when it was all like when it all came down to the end, it it wasn't it wasn't about redeeming their bad behavior. It was about letting them live in it and like letting mm -hmm. them see the letting them see the ultimate result of of their bad behavior. So the consequences of it. You're right. And it was the consequences of it. And hopefully grounded in reality, right? Yeah. 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 Hopefully. Thanks for watching Second in Command of Veep Rewatch. Yeah. Please hit the subscribe button and tune in every Tuesday when the new ones drop. Rewatch the show for exclusive behind the scenes stuff, info, insight, and more. Episodes coming. And thanks for watching. Yeah. Hit that uh, subscribe button. This is the mouse arrow, right? That's what you're representing. It's the a cursor. Of a, put it, do a little circle with your finger and it'll, it'll like be bigger so you can see where it is. Oh, okay.